description that your I, functional programming can help you write code that's like Pam Greer. And I realize that not everyone may know who Pam Greer is, so I thought I'd give you a short introduction by showing you the trailer for Foxy Brown. Pam Greer was a, yeah, no kidding. Um, Pam Greer is an action star of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and today. And Pam Greer is pretty awesome. So what does that have to do with us? Good question. Well, we want to learn to write code with drive that don't take no jive. So I want to introduce you to the Pam Greer criteria for code badassery. So Pam Greer, like the code that we want to write, is powerful, beautiful, and tough to mess with. So when I say powerful, I mean the code you can do big things with, you can do them easily, and you can do them quickly, right? Tough to mess with, I mean secure from manipulation. It's hard to, it's hard to mess up yourself. That's a good criteria of code. And also that it's easy to maintain. It's hard to mess up unintentionally later. Another word for this in terms of code is, quote, code is robust but I felt really weird calling Pam Greer robust, so I went with tough to mess with. The last one is beautiful. Um, so I'm not trying to objectify Miss Greer. Uh, I'm trying to functionify her, because it's fun. No, it's function, I get it. All right, um, the point is though, she is undoubtedly beautiful, um, and the last two attributes con contribute to that, and I think that's a really good analogy actually for functional programming. So, we want to write code that's elegant and that's concise and that is easily readable, although functional programming has a bad rep for that. And we want it to be able to be easily reused. That's a beautiful quality in code. And we also want it to be fun to write. If it's not fun to write, you're not going to want to write it and the language isn't going to get any, any, uh, any momentum. So this is a Scala meetup. We're talking about writing functional programming in Scala. Um, there's a couple things I just wanted to mention, some things that you're going to notice about the, the Scala code in here. Um, one is that you don't need parentheses for method calls. You can just, if you put the name of the method, you can then put the arguments after it. Another one is that semicolons are optional. Um, and return value is also optional. You can use semicolons, you can use a return value, but you don't have to, which is pretty cool. Um, another thing is that Scala is a statically typed language with type inference. Okay, that's a lot of buzzwords in a row. What statically typed means? is that everything that you declare has to have a specific type. If you have a variable and it's a, it's a sequence of characters that forms a word, that's a string and you say it's a string, and it has to be a string when you assign it. And what that, what, the place that that's enforced is at compile time rather than run time. So if you mess that up, the compiler's gonna tell you, you're not gonna be able to run the code. Now type inference is interesting. So if you've written Java code, you've probably written a lot of code where you like have to repeat the type eight times. You're like, this is a string. I'm passing you a string. You're getting back a string. And it's like, come on, computer. Like, why can't you figure that out? So Scala can, so that's pretty cool. So like, what does it look like? It's kind of small, I apologize. Uh, I'll make that bigger next time. Um, so we see we've got a value x, and we declare the type after. We say string equals a. So the type of the first one, what is it? The first line? Anybody that says it? It's a string, good job. What's the type of the second variable, y? Integer, you figured that out. What's the type of the third one? It's a float or a double. What's the type of the fourth one? It's a thing. So you're smart enough to figure that out by reading. The cool thing is that the Scala compiler is also smart enough to figure that out by reading. Um, I also show, threw up there a list declaration. Notice you don't have to declare what type of list it is. It knows it's a list of strings. Um, and just to show you that we access strings by, I'm sorry, we access elements in a list by just doing parentheses in the index. This is just a few like quick, just so you're like, ah, you're not like, whoa, what is that when we see some Scala code in action? So that's Scala. Um, here's a method in Scala. This is a haggling method. Um, I wanted to point out here that the types are defined after the variable name, which I mentioned before. Um, the return type here of haggle is a string, and it's defined after the argument list. So that's good to know. Um, notice there's no return in here. The last line of the method is the response, so it just returns the response. Um, if you take off the response here, actually, it still works, which is kind of crazy. If we were to do this, Oh, it's so tiny, even I can't read it, I apologize. Um, if we do this, 
still works. It's kind of cool. It just knows. It says, hey, the last expression that you defined is a string, so I'm going to give you back a string. And in fact, we could even take off this. And the code would still know. It's pretty cool, right? Um, so yeah. Notice uh, here, yeah, so that's just a little bit about what Scala looks like. Um, just so you're not, I don't want you to be surprised by anything in the code. Well, I do, but not just by the syntax. <laughs> functional programming, that's what you're here for. Functional programming is awesome, and you want to know how to do it, preferably without, you know, growing your proverbial neck beard, and I'll get to that in a bit. But what is functional programming? Okay, good question that no one asked me directly. Um, <laughs> So to answer that, we have to ask another question. Well, what is a program? Whoa, man. So I'm not just asking that to be philosophical, because it actually is important. Does anybody want to throw out a definition of what a computer program is? It's what? Set of instructions for a computer, very good. It was not a trick question. That was exactly the answer I was looking for. In fact, it's on the next slide. So we'll ask a kid. This is actually from single, Simple English Wikipedia. A computer program is a list of instructions that you tell, tells the computer what to do, right? So everyone knows, everybody, that's what a program is, right? Wrong! OK, sorry, little girl. That's not actually wrong. And our lovely participant, it's not actually wrong. That's true. That is, a, that is one definition of a computer program. That's what a computer program can be. However, that's not the only way to write a computer program. That's actually called imperative programming. Um, and, uh, and we have object-oriented programming, which some of you may be familiar with. It's a different variety of imperative programming as well. When you do imperative programming, you're saying, do this, then do that, then do the other thing, and then maybe give me back the value, right? We've, uh, most of us have probably written programs like that. Um, Object-oriented is a little different. It's saying, this is a doohickey that can do this, and this is a what'sit that can do that, so hey, doohickey, go ask the what'sit to do that. But it's still instructions, and they're just happen to be encapsulated in a different structure. So that's, that's the mo sort of more familiar type of programming that we normally do. If a program isn't that, if it's not a series of commands, then what is it? That's a good question, too. So. The concept behind functional programming is it asks the question, basically, what if instead of telling the, pro the computer what to do, we just told it what things are? Yeah, not like a lot of cheers, not a lot of like, ah, oh, because it's kind of a weird concept. Um, like, I mean, you're probably saying some stuff like, okay, I tell computer what th comu a computer what things are all the time, first off, so why is this different? You're probably also thinking, if I already knew what all the things were, I probably wouldn't even be writing a computer program. So fair enough, right? Um, but let's talk about what the evaluation of expressions mean instead of the execution of commands. So what's an expression? What things are? So this is an expression. So here's the first one. It says the Val the Queen is equal to Elizabeth II. That's, a, that's a, a, an assignment. That's a really common type of expression. However. This is also what things are. It says that the governor, given a state, is the top vote getter of all the candidates. And this is, this is a definition of a term, but it involves doing some computation to get the result. And so this last one is super important. It's critical. That's a function, and that's our building block for functional programming. So what is a function? Function is a relation between values where each input value gives you exactly one back. Thanks, E40. So, if you've taken a CS class or done programming before, you're probably thinking like, wait a second, that's not what I learned a function was. And this is a, this is a mathematical definition. So you may remember this from algebra or pre-algebra. So it's stricter than our normal programming definition. Our normal programming definition says a function is just a subroutine. It takes a parameter, sometimes no parameters, and it returns a value. What we're accepting as sort of our guiding principle when we're doing functional programming is that we're going to follow this definition of a function. So it's both a definition and a rule and kind of a guideline. Um, you don't always stick to this, but you try to as much as possible, and that's how you do functional programming. So it still, it still covers a lot of things that you know and love. Like you might know this as, a, in fact, as a static method. So you don't need an instance of a class to call a function like this. So here are some examples. We got math.square root. 
We've got collections.sort. When you copy an array, a lot of times you do this. These are all static methods, and these are functions under our, defi our new definition that we're accepting. So, does anyone recognize that bottom illustration? This is something I remember from math a long time ago. Um, it's like a black box, right? The idea is you put something in and you get something out. And you, when you put the same thing in, you always get the same thing out. And the reason why I included it is the thing that's important is that it's a box. It's closed. You can't, besides that one input area, put anything else in it, nor besides that one output area can you get anything else out, which is pretty important. And so here's a definition of something called a pure function, which is sort of this li more limited function that we've, we've adopted. So a pure function, basically, it can be described only in the terms of its return type, which is what comes out of the meat grinder down there, and its arguments, which what go is what goes in the top. And it, that means it doesn't touch anything else in the rest of the program, which is pretty interesting. That's our building block. Um, We've taken away some of our abilities when we do that, right? Like, manipulating state is a pretty important thing to do in a computer program. So, begs the question, what do we get in return? This cat is skeptical. I should have had that up while I was saying, sorry. Um, so, here's some things about functions that we're gonna go over. First one, functions are deterministic. You'll always get the same result if you put the same data in. That never changes. There's nothing, you can keep giving the same function the same thing over and over and over again, you never get anything back. I believe there's a definition of sanity that involves that. So this is a really calming thing to know. It's, it is, because you know, you can reason about the correctness of your small chunk of programming. And that's like, that's really useful, because if you're a working programmer and you've ever had a bug, you know how unusual that is, actually. So it kind of eliminates this entire like vector of bugs, which is where something happened in the rest of the program and all of a sudden my my program, my, my small sub-program is returning different values. It's also really nice for unit tests because you don't have to set up state. Um, debugging, it can make it easier to pinpoint where you need to debug. I am not gonna say debugging functional programming is easier because that is not true. But this can have benefits for debugging in that, look, if something's going wrong with this function, you know it's, you know, if something's going wrong with the output and the input, you know it's happening inside the function you know something outside didn't cause it. So, as I just said. So this is tough to mess with. Pam approves, um, and so this is pretty cool, so we wanna keep that. Another one is that functions are encapsulated. This is a really cool concept. So has, has anyone like done any object-oriented programming in a big way? Yeah, so I in college, they taught us object-oriented programming, and I remember being quizzed and quizzed on the four benefits of object-oriented programming, and I can't remember any of them except encapsulation right now. Um, um, abstraction, maybe? But anyway, encapsulation is really important. What that means, basically, is like the stuff inside the function, it's a black box in a lot of ways, and one of them is that you don't care what happens inside of it. As you, have, you have the description of the function acts as a contract, right? It says, if you give me this, I'll give you that every time, guaranteed. That's pretty cool. So this is really good for readability. Um, it means sort of that you can skip large chunks of things if you don't care about them. It's kind of like what I was saying with debugging, right? Like if, you're, if, that, if that function ain't broke, you don't need to read it. That's kind of nice. Um, it helps with reuse. It means, it means if that description of the function fulfills your contract requirements, you can use it somewhere else and you're not gonna worry that the original caller is somehow changing it. Um, and it helps with maintainability, actually, which is I think a really awesome salient point. Um, you kind of have these, mo these small chunks, and you know that by creating that, you've agreed, to, you've agreed to keep it that way. So it encourages you to break things down and make things smaller, and that's usually a good thing. This is beautiful, I think. This is a really elegant way to write code. Um, it, it's, it's making promises in your function declarations that are, are very, you can rely on them, so I like that. This is also tough to mess with. Um, for the issues, I, for the reasons I said before, you kind of have this unspoken agreement with not only yourself, but yourself in the future and all other programmers who are using your code. This is what my function takes and this is what it returns, so that's cool. Functions are commutative. I don't know if that's the right word, actually. I looked it up on Wikipedia and it looked like a pretty good word. What I was trying to say was that the order doesn't matter. This is a fancy way of saying that, right? So if we look at this code, if you squint and look at it, it says you've got a val first thing 
and it does one thing. You've got a val second thing, and it calls do another thing. And the third thing depends on the results of those two values. Does it matter if we do one thing before another thing? Not really, we don't care, as long as we've got it by the time we're ready to do the last thing. And this, this is like a super powerful concept, because what this means is you've got these little chunks of work, and you can parcel them out to different machines and to different threads, and that's where we're going. Um, the chips aren't getting, they aren't having more capacity, instead we're running into parallel cores, and parallel computing is, is becoming more and more important. And function programming, you get some of that just for free, you don't have to worry about crazy structure or anything like that, because if you've got your little chunk, you know that, that it can be run while other chunks are being run. Um, another thing that's useful about it is lazy evaluation. Let's say in this example, do another thing takes freaking forever to run. That happens sometimes, right? Well, what you can do in a functional programming language is you can, you can just wait to run it until you need it. Instead of when you initialize the program, running that really long do another thing and you know your users are just waiting there like watching the spinny thing, you can wait until they click on whatever it is, build the widget, and do it then. So that's pretty cool. Data is immutable. So this one is pretty interesting. This is one that to me was not immediately obvious from looking at the, at the definition of a pure function. What this is saying basically is that once you've created an object, you cannot change it. And if you want an object that differs in some way, you gotta make a new copy. So you're probably familiar with this from if you've used Java because this is how string works. String is immutable. So we've got two strings up here, right? First one says San Dimas High School Football Rules. And the second one, we've taken the first one and we've called two uppercase on it. Now, S2 altered S1, right? It changed it, it called it, it made it uppercase. What happens if, if you do print line with S1? Is it uppercase or lowercase? It's lowercase, and the reason why is string is immutable, and immutable means it cannot be changed, so if you want that uppercase string, you gotta copy it and then uppercase it. So this is pretty powerful, actually. Um, this means that there's another whole class of bugs, you can just like, pfft, don't care. Like, I'm done with it, because the reason why is you know once you've got an object that no one's gonna change that. There isn't gonna be another calling program that changes it, right? It's also tough to mess with, like I said. Um, it kinda gets, it gets rid of some bugs for you, so that's pretty cool. Scala actually has both immutable and immutable data structures. There are some things that are really hard to do with um, immutable data structures, and one thing that might be coming to mind is it can sometimes be less performant not always, and we can talk about that afterwards if anybody wants, because it's a complicated subject, but um, it can be slower. So sometimes you need immutable data structure, but Scala defaults to immutable, so we want to just do immutable. So this is our building block. It's pretty cool. Functions are deterministic. Functions are encapsulated. They're commutative, by which I mean order of operation doesn't matter. Any math folks, let me know if that's not the right word. And data is immutable. Does anybody have any questions at this point about those four things? Mm -mm. That's absolutely true. They are, and that's absolutely true. And um, they're not new, and these, any, any, not only can any language use these, people have been encouraging folks in Java to do this for a long time. And if you go read, um, has anyone read Effective Java? It's a pretty good book, it's by Josh Block, and it talks about some like best practices for Java, and it's been around for a while. The first edition came out in like, what, 96, 97 or so? Maybe that's wrong, that could be totally wrong. Um, he covers all three of these concepts, and in, he especially encourages people to make data immutable. So you're totally right, not new concept at all. In fact, nothing I'm gonna cover is a new concept. I will point out the one, th there's w one or two main things about Scala that you can't do in Java, but none of this is new. And in fact, functional programming goes back quite a while, so. Um, I hope I can, I hope, one of my goals with this talk is to explain why it's, why it's having a resurgence and why people are interested in it now. And a lot of that has to do with what I was talking about with parallelization, because that's become more and more of an issue. So this is our building block. Anyone have any other questions? It's a great, great, great point, indeed. This isn't new. We're, we are, in fact, reinventing the wheel here. <laughs> so this is our building block. Let's build. I really like that, guys. Lego. That's Legos, guys. Whoa. OK. Um, but how do we do it? So. We maybe need some like guidelines or concepts to like snap these together. Because right now all we've got is these little floating bits of computation. And 
I mean, you know, yeah, sometimes you just want the square root of something, but usually you want to do something more elaborate. So let's figure out how to do that. So one of the ways that we can snap our functions together, and this is the one I was talking about, this is something actually that you can't do in Java, is treating functions as first-class citizens. So functions are first-class objects in Scala. So what does that mean? It's kind of like a weird, it sounds almost kind of political, right? Um, I don't think it is, I don't know. Uh, so what's a first-class citizen? A first-class citizen is an object that can be assigned to, a, or a, sorry, not just an object, but a type of object that can be assigned to a variable, stored in a data structure, returned as a value, and then passed to a function. Let me get there. We're doing the strings first. So, so that, that, but you're right. I am saying that, because that's the last one on the list, right? And it's actually my favorite. But, um, well, I don't know. I'm not going to pick a favorite. So this is a string, and I'm just showing you here with a string. We've assigned it to a variable. We've made a list of them. We've stored them in a data structure. We've passed it to a, to a method, and then we've returned it from a method. Tie a knot returns a string. Or maybe it was the other way around. Um, I wanted to show that in Java, you, you, and in Scala as well, of course, you can do this with uh, like user-specified objects or user-specified defined classes. Like if we defined a rope, we could then assign it to a variable. We could store it. We could have a list of ropes. We could, we could create functions that took ropes in. And then we could also create functions that returned ropes. So we can do this in Java with, or I'm sorry, in Scala with functions, which it turns out is like a really big deal. So right here, I'm just doing the first two. I'm assigning a function to a variable, and I'm storing it in a data structure. So let me see if I can actually make this a little bigger. Does that help? It might ruin some of my funny images later, but we'll deal with it when we get to it, guys. Um, so right here, I've, I've defined a very important, powerful, parallelized, enterprise scale function that when you pass it a string, it adds and spam to the end of it. Um, obviously a very important uh, task to do. So I wanted to, to show a little bit. So this, is, this looks, even to me now, a little bit like just like a forest of punctuation, right? I mean, we've used basically the entire, you just like hit shift and went like that over the top uh, row of the keyboard. So I wanted to go through it a little bit. So add spam as a value. It's just like the value that we defined for string. And add spam has a type. The type is this whole thing. So add spam's type is a function that takes a string and returns a string. And so that's the structure. It's list of parameters types, arrow return type. So arrow sort of signifies, uh, arrow to the, is that my left or right? Arrow to the, to the left, <laughs> sorry, uh, signifies a function. So that's the type of add spam. So once I've defined it, I can then call add spam on egg and bacon and get that. At this point, it's not that different than a def, but hey, you can do that. Might be worth doing sometime. Might be, it might help. One benefit I could think of doing this is for readability. Um, if you have a function that maybe you didn't write, but that has a really impenetrable name, you might want to rename it, and you could do it with this. Um, we also could put a list of functions in there and then call the function directly from the array. Again, it's kind of interesting, but not like super useful. So let's get on to the next ones. The next one after this would be returning a function as a value. OK. Returning functions from functions. So up here, I've defined this function tag text. And this is something that you might do if you were, for some reason, creating XML by hand or HTML by hand, right? So you've got text, and you, wanna, you don't want to write a separate function every time you want to add a new tag. You don't want to don't have to write a new bold function and write a new italic function. People don't even use those anymore, right? Uh, oh, gosh. So um, you, you would write this tag text, and you could pass in the tag and the text. So if we call tag text with emphasis, and we put in pay attention, the result would be pay attention tags with emphasis. And we could instead put in you know, strong and I'm really strong, and it would, it would have I'm really strong tagged with strong. So that's all right. To be honest, I find that not super readable. You're doing tag text M, pay attention, and I have to, in my head, sort of like move the M out and figure out what's going on there. So one other way of doing this would be to have 
this um, function that returns another function, right? So tag text two, I rewrote it, is another function, is another forest of parentheses, and I realize I probably didn't really help with this particular definition, but tag text two takes in a tag, which is a string, and it returns a function. So it's the same thing we saw before. It's a little hard to read, but if you look in here, what you've got is you've got a parameter list, an arrow, and then the definition of the function. So tag text two, if you pass and spam, it returns this, tag with and spam. Tag with and spam is a function, and tag with and spam itself can be called on something else, which is kind of cool. I think this is actually really beautiful. I find that more, that I find that much easier to read, to read tag text with something and then the text itself. And it, it doesn't really clutter anything up or take any more lines of code to create a bunch of functions that are named really verbosely using a function like this. That's pretty cool. Um, powerful. So one way that this is really useful is in writing libraries, actually. Um, the reason why that's really useful is because it means that you can provide your users with like a framework and then let them specialize as much as they want. So when I defined tag text two, I didn't constrain what tags you wanted to put in there. I hate to say it, but add spam is actually not valid HTML5 tag, I don't know why. Um, but if I wanted to define it, I can. And if I had some need to as a consumer of this code, I totally can, that's pretty cool. Um, you also, you count as a consumer of your own code. I, I've read all these quotes too where it's like, if you come back to code you wrote a month ago and it doesn't look terrible, you're doing it wrong, and I always find that to be true, and I'm always having to reuse my own code, and so thinking about yourself in the future is kind of a good thing. Even if you aren't reusing something at the moment, you may wanna do something different with it later, so being as flexible as possible is pretty cool. Um, just like a little nerdy side note, you could use this function. You notice I basically just took a function with two parameters and broke it into a function with one parameter that returns another function. You can do this with any um, function of multiple parameters. And Haskell, which is a really very functioning pro functional programming focused language, actually does that, so it's pretty crazy. It's called currying. Um, it's also called partially applying a function. Uh, so does partial application make sense to describe that? We partially applied tag text to when we gave it add spam, and then we finally applied it when we gave it the text in the middle. So partially applied, it's also called currying after Haskell Curry, the, whose first name is the, is, he's the namesake of Haskell, the language? I think that's right. Okay, so, so far we've assigned them as variables, we've put them in data structures, and we've returned them as functions. Now we're gonna do the last part, and I lied, this is my favorite part. Now we're gonna pass some functions as arguments to other functions. Function party. So this is actually the meat of functional programming. I did not make this, by the way. Um, it was created by a professor at Willamette University as a design, proposed design for like Haskell shirts, and he has a whole webpage with like a bunch of them, and they're maybe my favorite thing. Like, like functional programmers like it hot, and it stands for higher order and typed. <laughs> ah, it's awesome. So functions that take functions, the joke here is that functions that take another function are called higher order functions. Um, and like I said, that's the meat. You need that for functional programming. And this is not something that you can do with Java. You can build interfaces that allow you to approximate it, but it's, it's not possible. And this is like kind of the big value add for Scala. It's allowing you to do this. So let's talk about something that you actually use instead of my silly and spam example, for loops. For loops all the time. That's just something that, as a programmer, you use constantly, right? And so this is a really stupid for loop, admittedly, but it's in its structure is something that probably you've done a million times in Java. Um, you've got an array. You put it, set up a for loop. You say, starting at zero, until the length of this array, I want to increment i, and for each index in i, do something. Here, it's something stupid. You're gonna print out, hey, the other day I ate a name of fruit. But you know, you, you, you do pretty complex stuff with that. That's a basic building block of imperative programming. So I rewrote this in Scala. Um, Scala declares, has its array of fruits, or its list of fruits. It's basically the same concept. The for loop looks a little different. Um, it starts at zero and it goes, uh, it's, it has this until syntax to go until fruits dot length and it just assumes you're stepping by one. Otherwise though, it's basically the same thing, right? It's not any different as I've written them here. 
So I think that there's a better way to do this. How many times have you written something like this where you've stepped through a list? So many times, right? It's boilerplate code. It's boilerplate code that I fat finger more often than I care to admit as well. That's just like number one. If I see something weird going on with iterating through a list, I'm like, oh, I typed it wrong. Cool, I typed it wrong. Like that's my first thought. That's, that sucks. I'm gonna posit that we have really, really powerful machines right here that we you know, take with us in our backpacks on the train, and they should be able to do that kind of thing for us. So let's do it. Let's get abstract. Let's abstract that boilerplate away because I'm sick of typing a for loop. So one way to do this, because now we have this magical power in Scala where we can write a function that takes a function. So one way to do this might be to write a new function and have it take an array and then that inner function. Does that make sense to you guys? If we go back, and we look at this, this guy is like a mini function in here. And that's the only part that ever changes. So I want to abstract something that lets me just pass that part into my function. So that's my sort of proposed syntax. It's a for each is what I'm calling it. It's going to take a list of fruits, because we're iterating through fruits right now. It evolves, I, I, it evolves into pie, I promise, spoiler alert. Um, a list of fruits, and then it takes a function that's gonna, that's gonna do, for, it's gonna t transform a fruit, argument of fruit, into a unit. That's Scala's word for void. So uh, basically it's gonna take a fruit and return nothing. Shouldn't do that, but we're gonna do it. So with my, with my um, sort of concept here, I've kind of defined a, a sample for each program uh, function. So what it does is it takes our fruit list and our function, and it iterates over the list, because that's the same thing we always do. I know I'm gonna do it. The minute I get a list, I know I'm gonna for loop over it, and it calls the function on each individual fruit member. Okay. So if I rewrote, rewrite that, I would have my, my fruits, I define a function, and then I do for each, for each fruits, tell them. So one thing that's kind of about, cool about that is kind of readable. So more, let's do it more. So sometimes I want to talk about things that aren't fruit, like pie. So I want to make it generic. So what I'm doing here is A is kind of like anything. So what this is saying is if I give for each a list of anything, as long as my function can handle anything, it's cool, we can iterate through it. So even more abstract, what if we weren't limited to lists? What if I had a set of fruit? What if I had a map of fruits to their countries of origin? I mean, I could have a lot of fruit collections. I actually, this is true, was a member of a Fruit of the Month Club in high school, um, which is a kind of a collection. Um, so this is even more abstract, right? I've defined this so I can do my for each on any kind of collection of any kind of thing, although I don't know what you would do except for fruit, and I don't know. I don't even know why you'd be writing about that. Um, this basically, with a lot of hand waving, is what Scala did. And so this is how you'd actually write the sort of moronic talk about fruit method in Scala. So it's fruits for each tellum. All right, it's not bad, right? So this little function that we defined earlier, so I've moved the function we defined earlier into that collection code, so we're now calling our for each on collections. <laughs> This is not how Scala implemented for each. I want to be super clear about that because I feel like otherwise people are going to leave mean comments on the video. This isn't even close to how Scala implemented for each. The writers of, of the Scala collections library used all sorts of really cool functional tricks that even I don't know about it, believe it or not. They, they use different ways of doing it that are faster and smarter and safer than this. So that's cool. That's a good thing. And so that's kind of one of the values of this kind of abstraction, right? Someone way smarter than me can figure out how to do it way better, and I don't have to change my code to get that, those benefits. So that's really cool. Um, it gets better without, without changing things, and I can't make stupid fat finger mistakes like I do i equals one or whatever. I do i plus plus plus, and it doesn't compile. Things like that. I don't even have the opportunity to do them anymore. So that's awesome. And it's powerful. It's cool balance because we get to configure what we want without really caring about the mechanics. So you get a lot of, a lot of stuff out of it. It's pretty cool. 
So something kind of juicier um, is now we're trying to do this thing where we've got a list of fruits and we want to make a list of pies out of them. So I just want to point out here that dot dot is list concatenation. Um, it says take a list of pies and add to the front my new pie. Does that make sense to folks? I'm creating, I'm adding a new pie to this list. So I want to take a list of fruits and turn it into a list of pies. So on a, this is also another really common thing that you do with for loops. Um, you want to, to, for each member of the list, make something out of it or do something to that member. It's pretty common, something you do all the time. So data is immutable, remember, with functions, so want to return a new member. But basically, otherwise, going through and doing something to each member of the list is super common. We do it all the time. So there's this, there's this function called map, which does that for us. The same way for each went through and just did something without a return value to each member, map is going to go through and make a new pie for each fruit on the list. And it's going to return a list which is pretty interesting. So these, this code and this code are equivalent. Does that make sense to folks? Awesome. So I'm gonna get even crazier here. So back there, we defined make pi as this function. We were doing that thing we saw earlier where we can assign a function to a variable. We don't, well, this is a silly example because of course you would need the function make pi again. You're gonna use that all the time, right? But Let's assume we only needed it for that one step. We don't need the intermediate value. You don't, have to, you don't have to declare it as a variable. You can pass it directly into the function. So I've done some examples up here. We do this a lot with, with other kinds of objects, with primitives. So up here, instead of, instead of declaring a string that's the kind of fruit I want to make my pie, out, my pie out of, I can just pass that string right in. That's a pretty power, that's a pretty useful concept. Um, the reason why that's useful actually, so at first you might just think, okay, cool, you're saving some lines of code. The other thing that's really useful about that, blueberry, in this, in this example, blueberry fruit uses kind of fruit, right, to make its pie. Kind of fruit is a reference. And kind of fruit could, through a malicious or simply incompetent actor, be changed by, by another program, another function, another program, just another programmer doing something bad. So, that would really screw up your function. You wouldn't get what you expected. So if you don't need that intermediate value, it's a really good idea to pass it in anonymously because then you know what the value is. We can do this with a function. Um, and so I've done it here. Instead of the, those first two lines are equivalent to the last one. So I want to stop here and make sure people can read that last line. I, I understand it's pretty confusing if you've never seen this before. But basically, map is still, it's still a method on, on the collection, and we're, we're declaring a function anonymously and passing it in. Does that make sense to folks? Any questions about, yeah, Carolyn. So the difference between map and for each, and let me see, oh, I thought I had defined it. Um, the difference between map and for each is that for each's return type is unit, and map's return type is a list. So yeah, so for each doesn't do doesn't give you anything back. It just does something for each one. Map on the other hand is going to do something to each member of the list. Um, that something could return you if you were doing it over fruits. It could return you a fruit. So you could be peeling each fruit, and you'd get a list back of unpeeled fruit, or it could create something new, like a pie, like we did in this example. Does that make sense to folks? Yes. That's true. That's why we don't use for loops. Right. <laughs> You've hit upon it. So you're right. Um, you don't want to be changing. And the, the only useful thing to do would be to output. So that for each that I was calling dumb actually is maybe the only reasonable place to use a for, uh, for loop. And that's why we don't use them. So I've rewritten this. I've rewritten our original one in this second block to take the anonymous function. And then I'm thinking, well, what if my list of fruit changes, season changes, all of a sudden now it's pumpkin pie season? And I'm going to just go ahead and make pies take a list of fruits. Does that make sense to folks instead of hard coding it? The, cool, the kind of cool thing there is that we've reduced this down to a one-liner. And I, th I think that's pretty interesting. If we go back to the original one, which was up here, We've gone from that to one line. Um, 
You can argue about the readability. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, the kind of thing that's kind of cool, it's still a one-liner. That makes it really easy to pass it anonymously into other stuff. And we talked about the benefits of passing anonymously, right? You can't get messed with if you do that. So that's beautiful. Collection handling. So there are a bunch of methods like this, and I'm going to talk about a few of them briefly. Um, I encourage you to explore them on your own. One is filter. Filter takes an, a function that takes in um, a member of your list, and it, 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 uh, it, takes in a member of your, it takes in a function that, this is kind of hard because you get, you get into, it's a function that does a function that this. So filter takes a function that, that takes a member of your list and returns a Boolean. And what it's going to do is it's going to return a list with only those members that satisfied that Boolean. So that's a pretty common thing too, right? You'll iterate through a list and you only want to get back ones that meet certain conditions. Um, so in my example here, I've filtered out pear and honeydew because I don't like those fruits. I think they're watery. Um, fold. So fold is a little more complicated. So another thing that for loop, the, I think the glaring omission here is accumulation. A lot of times you'll do a for loop to count, right? You'll do a for loop to add all the values. I want to get all the votes. I want to get the to a cumulative age of everyone in this room. You would do a for loop, right? So fold lets you pass in a beginning value, and it's going to take a function, and what it's going to do is going to take that first value, and that first value is an accumulator. And it's going to call your function on the first on the first, it's going to call your function on the first value plus the first value of the list. It's going to take the result and it's going to call it with the second value and the third value and the four value. It accumulates. Um, counting, like I said, is such a common case that there's actually a, um, a like uh, syntactic sugar for it. There's a different method for it called called uh, reduce, and reduce just starts at zero and counts. These can go left or right. So the reason why I want to show you guys is an example of how powerful functional programming is. Um, Google, a company you may have heard of, uh, with a combination of map and filter, has used that, or sorry, yeah, uh, map and reduce, filter too, probably, um, safe search, right? Map and reduce has used that to index the web, and it's a framework for doing like massively huge data processing, and it's used by a bunch of people as well. Could you grab me my plug for my computer? Thank you. All right, so this is powerful. You can't see, because I made the text bigger, but there's Pam down at the bottom. That's super powerful. Nested for loops, we do this all the time, right? Um, the examples in books are always like cards, like you go, you loop over the suits and then over the whatever ordinal numbers. Um, I find cards kind of boring. So I did pi, because I do not find pi boring in the slightest. So for here, um, this is an example. So everyone knows vanilla, vanilla ice cream and apple pie go well together. Maybe you want to try all the possible pairings of pie and ice cream in the world, right? That would be awesome. Um, you would probably get sick. This is a nested for loop to let you do this. It's going to go over for each pie that you have in your list. It's going to take the pie, and for each ice cream you have in your list, it's going to make a serving with a piece of that pie and a piece of that ice cream. So probably a lot of pie and ice cream, but sometimes for science you have to suffer. So we know that we can um, we can reduce a for loop with maps, right? So one way to do this, and I'm going to make this really big. Let's just do that, right? This, this for loop here in the inside, let's make that map instead. So, hang on, sorry. So if we go in here, right, and we do map, we replace this with map. I'm gonna say, um, well, we've got ice creams, right? That's a list. So we can, I, ice creams we can map over. And what we want to do for each one is we want to take an ice cream. So that's our, um, that's our param, and so it needs to be in parentheses. And we're going to create a function that creates a new serving. So we have a function that creates a new serving. Um, and we, you know, we don't need to add it to serving because it's a map. It's going to return a list. So it's going to return a list of ice creams for each pie. Does that make sense? Um, we probably could go ahead and do it with the other one, right? Maybe. I didn't want to go next. OK, so we could do it again. So we're mapping over the pie, and we're mapping over the ice cream. And we're returning a new serving for each. Awesome, right? One little problem. This code isn't going to compile. So the reason why, 
map returns a list, right? So we've got, for each pi, we have a list. We're gonna end up with a list of lists. That's not the type we want, we just want a list of servings. So we're kind of stuck, right? Like, we're gonna have to do something else to get our list of lists into one whole list. And so there is a method for that, it's called flatten. Flatten takes a list of lists and it turns it into one list. So we've got, this is how we would call it. We have our thing, our, our double map that returns a um, list of lists. We're gonna call flatten on it. Here's my question. This is the functional programming way of doing a nested for loop. This is what it looks like. Is this better than that? I don't know, kinda looks about the same length maybe a little less readable. Pam Greer is skeptical, and I'm skeptical too, frankly. So the solution comes in the form of function composition. So function composition is taking two functions and taking the, the return value of one and passing it to the other, so you make one big function. And I love this illustration. I think it's such a good illustration of that, right? It's, pretty, it's a pretty simple concept. You could see it as f of g of x expressed that way a lot. I've got these two functions, bake a pie and eat a pie. Sometimes I bake a pie and I don't eat it right away. That's unusual. Sometimes I eat a pie that I did not bake. That's more usual. So I need both these functions, right? But also sometimes I just want to bake and eat a pie. And so I want to take my fruit and my crust and I want to turn it into a happy Kelsey. And I can do that instead of writing a whole new function, I can compose them. Here's where the magic happens. Flatten compose flat map, which is, or fat, flatten compose map, which is what we had to do earlier, right? We had to call map and then flatten. It's called flat map. Flat map is magic. This is true, and I will show you. So flat map basically is a map and then a flat. <laughs> so it takes a map and creates a list of lists and then it flattens it into one big list. This is pretty cool. So. I want to make this bigger. What do you guys think this code does? Just guessing from reading it. Anybody want to take a guess? Takes pies and ice creams and then it, it creates a serving, right? This actually, as it turns out, is equivalent. It's syntactic sugar for doing this, which I think is actually really cool. Basically, the way that for yield works is it flat maps until the last one and then it maps. Because this is so common, nested loops, something you do all the time. So Scala has this syntactic sugar to make that easier. It calls flat map, it calls flat map, it calls map, and then it yields the results in a list, which is what you wanted from the beginning. This is beautiful. Oh man, all my fonts got out. I'm gonna put these up on the internet and you can see how, how lovely all of this was supposed to be. Um, so, for yield is pretty cool because you can do all this cool stuff with it, right? So, you can also do um, assignments in there and you can do filters. So, in this first one, we, got, we get all of our pairings, right? But we only return the ones that taste good. Or in this one, we get all of our pairings and we only return the ones that taste good and then we give a serving to each one in the audience and I get all these thank yous back. It's a good, it's a good thing. It's pretty cool and this is pretty powerful. You can, with building on these, do a lot of stuff. Uh, so, oh, I'm blown up too big, sorry. Powerful, there she is. So this is cool, right? So these are some ways we can put functions together. So I have one more way and then we'll be done. But we're gonna take a quick detour. It's not a detour, but it's gonna seem like a detour. Null, what is null? Talk to me, what's null? Not a trick question. Nothing, it's nothing. What can be null in Java? Anything, anything, almost anything, you're right. There are some distinctions, but almost anything, any reference can be null in Java. What happens if you reference a null object? NP everything explodes, it also known as a null pointer exception. What kind of code does this lead to? Oh, yuck. So, Big ups to my coworker, Doug. I kind of um, cribbed some of his code here, um, his examples here. But um, this is an example of, of how you might have to write. You, you, want, you want to write some code that, let's say we mapped all those pairings and we mapped the best one, and we want to write some code that looks up, given, a, given pi, looks up the best pairing and serves it. Okay, 
So in, in Java, we can't assume that map isn't null. We don't know where it came from. We don't know who touched that. We also, here's another thing, when we get that, we can't assume the pi we're passing has an entry in there. What if you pass cow pie? The answer would probably be null, unless we tasted that, which is gross. Um, and so you have to be able to return null as well, because it could be that there wasn't a, there wasn't a best pairing to serve. Okay, so Scala programming doesn't use null, yay! Reference types can't be null in Scala, you can't make them null. Um, cool, let's stop using null, let's rewrite this. Uh, okay, so the first one we don't have to check, and the second one, wait a second. So, null sucks, but sometimes things are null. And so an example, a really good example that's used all the time, is when you get something, you call get on a map, or a, you know, associative whatever, and there's no, there's no corresponding value. So what should you return in that case? It's kind of hard to say, it might depend on the type, right? So maybe we do need a concept of nothing. Scala has one, it's called an option. An option is like a parent type and it has two child types. Um, it's either a sum that has a, a value of any kind inside and we've specified that when we called it, or it's a none. So I have this example of a string. We've got an option of a string. So it's like a container, does that make sense? Like a list is a list of a string. It's an option of a string and it's either some string or it's none. So if we do get on a sum, we get the value back. If we call, is defined on a sum, it's true. So we have these two functions. If we do get on a none, it returns a no such element, and if we do is defined, it's false. Okay, so let's rewrite that, you know? So this is what it was. Oh, so here we go, I'm um, sorry. So we've rewritten this. We have an option now that we do. When we, go, when we call the get on the map, we get an option back. And then if it's defined, we return a serving, and we have to wrap it in a sum, because it could be none, and if it's not defined, we return a none. Again, this isn't really any better. Looks a lot like that, right? So that option by ourselves doesn't get us much. Oh, and by the way, what does that have to do with functional programming, right? Why am I telling you this? Ha ha. Option is kind of like a collection. Collections have map, filter, flat map, reduce, def all defined on them. Turns out, so does option. So when you map over an option, you get back an option. You call map and you pass a function that does something to the value. But it only does something to the value if the value exists, if it's a sum. So does that make sense to folks? You want to you do something to the value if it's in there. And if not, you want it to be safe. You don't want it to explode in your face. We've also got flat map. So the reason why you might need flat map, right? So my favorite pie is rhubarb, right? And I want to get the pairing from rhubarb because I'm stoked about it, right? I can't call it directly because it's an option because not everyone has a favorite pie, crazy as it may sound. Some people like all of them. So what I'm doing is I'm mapping, I, in my, I, I try mapping, right? I try mapping and calling get on that pairings map and getting the pairing back. Here's the problem. Looks a little like our last problem. We get a sum of a sum of butter pecan, pecan which is the best ice cream to have with rhubarb pie. So we can't really use a sum of a sum. Things get complicated. So we need a flat map again to do that kind of operation. You also can do filter. Um, I don't, I don't, oh, I put butter pecan. I don't like pecan pie. I think it's way too sweet. So if I'm at a restaurant and this, I want to know what the pie is, I'm going to order it unless it's pecan pie, right? So my order is going to be some, it's going to be the same thing as today's special unless it's pecan pie and then it's going to be none. So here's where it gets cool. Because we have flat map defined, because we have map, you can do a for yield over option. So check out this code. It says, today's special, pie, pairings.get, best ice cream. Get that one and yield my dessert. If any of those are none, the computation stops and we get back a none, which is really powerful. And so I, wa I want to explain again, the value on the left is the inner value. It's like when you have a list in a for yield, you get the value that's in that list. We're getting the value that's in that sum. If any of those are none, the result is none. And so this is a dumb example, admittedly, but this is a really common um, pattern where you have a bunch of values and you need to validate all of them before performing a final computation. Or you need to do a step, a series of steps of computations 
But if any of them don't pass a validation, you have to stop. Or if any of them do, do something wrong, you have to stop. This is pretty cool. We know four yield is beautiful and powerful, right? We saw Payongri already. But this is like especially tough to mess with. It's really readable, for one thing. Um, I mean, this almost tells you in English what's going on, which is basically that I'm picky. Um, it also, it eliminates a huge source of, of bugs that are directly related to programmer error, where you just forgot to check. I think that's really cool. So for yield took care of nested for loops, and it also took care of nested if statements. Because that's basically what this is, right? Like, if the today's special is good, and then if I have a pairing for it, and if they have that ice cream, give me the dessert. So we took care of these two nested layers of boilerplate. OK. Why could we do that? We could do that because option is a monad. Everyone should go, ah! Because monads are famously scary. This is like the part of functional programming. They're like, the average programmer will never be able to understand this. Um, I don't think this is true. Let's talk about what is a monad, though. Let's go into it really briefly. Admittedly, this is a complicated concept. There are approximately 40 million tutorials on the web about what is a monad. Um, they all have like crazy metaphors, like it's an assembly line, spaceship, burrito man. But <laughs> I'm going to give it to you straight. This is what it is. I'm not. Um, Daniel Spivak, I think, um, is a really awesome writer on Scala, by the way. Highly recommend his blog. Um, this is a quote from a blog post of his. And I've linked this, so I'll put the slides up and you guys can read the whole thing. What is it that makes thing a monad, option, or list, or another monad? OK, so there's, there's two things going on. One is that you can wrap up a value inside of it. You know how to do this with a list. You do it with a list all the time. We just saw to do it with an option. It's pretty easy. You just say option contains this value. Um, the other one is that you have this function that digs in there. It's going to dig inside the thing, and it's going to take it's going to take a function that we supply and use it to take that value and make a new thing. So that was a lot of words, but that's the flat map process we just saw. You have a function, and you have a process that's been abstracted away that lets you get in there and apply that function to the value, and it returns the same type. Scala calls that flat map. Again, I explained why it's called flat map. Until I read this, I didn't understand what was so special about flat map. This is what's so special about flat map. It lets you make new things. It lets you take a thing and use its value to compute a new thing, which is a really powerful concept. It's magic. It hides our boilerplate. And we saw two ways already how it does that. We saw how it hides our boilerplate for lists, right? It hides that for loop. And then we saw how it hides a nested if statement boilerplate. Um, that's tough to mess with. That's really cool. Anytime we can eliminate boilerplate, we're doing good for ourselves as programmers because we're, we're limiting the points of failure. And that's, I mean, I think really, I think, I think one of the things that drives me to be a good programmer is that I'm very lazy and I'm very sloppy and I want a machine to keep me from being those things. And once I get my Roomba to do all of the household chores, I'll be really happy. But until then, I'm satisfied with FlatMap. So these aren't the only monads. Um, you can have monads that do a lot of things. You can accumulate errors. So what we saw is we stopped when we got an error, and the definition of flat map meant that you couldn't keep going with computations in your four yield. But you could accumulate them. One example of where you'd want to do that is if you were validating a web form, and you'd want to see all the errors that someone made. And so you would still have an error result at the end, but you would have all their errors listed. That's one, one kind of monad. Another one might be a cursor position in a database um, or file to let you know how you can move forward. States in a state machine. And then this one's pretty powerful. And this one's hard to wrap your head around, so I won't expect you to. An environment that changes can be a monad, where you've got a function that lets you go into this environment, change it, and pass it on to the next function. And this is mainly how we handle side effects in functional programming, because you have to be able to handle side effects. And that's one of the things that turns people off from side effects, for, I mean, from functional programming, because all code has side effects. I mean, I write for the web, so I'm dealing with nothing but side effects. But monads are the way we handle those. So this is so powerful. This is like the thing about functional programming that freaking rules. This is the thing. Getting rid of that boilerplate and, and having the computer do it for you is the reason why people like functional programming so much. And it's the reason why people fall in love and become very fanatic about it. So here's just a brief extra credit whoa. <laughs> Semicolon is a monad. That's right. Just don't think about it right now. Just think about when you're going to bed tonight. That's right. OK. 
So we're pretty much done. I want to go over the ways that we talked about to, to sort of state, to click our blocks together and build something cool. Um, partial application, also known as currying, so that was really useful. It lets us create a bunch of functions from one master function, and it lets us let other people create other functions from that master function. Higher order functions, that's awesome. That lets us um, abstract away iteration and operations over containers. Functional composition lets us use our building blocks very directly composing them. That one's maybe the best Lego metaphor. Um, for yield, which is syntactic sugar, but it's pretty cool syntactic sugar. And then monads, which is the big scary one. Um, so yeah, that's it. I just have three more slides about the psychology of functional programming. So I titled this without learning a neck, learning functional programming without growing a neck beard because I think a lot of people are intimidated by functional programming. I know I was certainly when I started working here and started using Scala. Um, big complaint is people say it's not readable. I'm sure having seen my tiny little punctuation for us like roll across the screen, you might agree. I think this quote is amazing. Um, I came across this in a closure tutorial, uh, and basically it says, is closure code, which is closure is also a functional program, it's a lisp, so talk about punctuation. Um, imagine if every time you read Java source code and you saw an if statement or a for loop or an anonymous class, you had to stop and figure out what it meant. Now, some of you who are newer to programming may remember that. Um, I know I do. That's a real thing. People don't come out of the womb knowing how to read Java code or imperative code in general. So there are things, except for Jordan back there, he did. Um, so <laughs> he, he was Ruby, Ruby from the age of two. Um, so you had to learn how to read that. And the same thing really does happen to you with map and flat map and for yield at this point. Um, you look at code and, and you can read it. You really do learn to read it. And those functions become less of a translation in your head. Oh, map means this. And oh, you're mapping over a list. And that's learning any language, any, including programming languages. So I really think that's a really good point and one that you don't hear a lot about functional programming. I think that functional programming is really good at DSLs, um, Scala specifically. I want to throw that out there, which goes totally contrary to the, to the reputation that it's not readable. This is an example of uh, library specs two for writing unit tests that I like a lot. Tell me that's not readable. That's literally plain English. And one of the things that's cool is not only is that plain English, this is completely configurable by the user. You can write your own matcher functions. So you can say, such and such input must redirect to a certain path, must have a certain state, must look like a certain thing. And those are a little more tricky to write, but once you write them, you can use them over and over again. Anyone can look at your test code and see what it's supposed to be doing. I think that's really cool. Finally, I told you about peer functions. I think it's really kind of unfortunate that there's a concept of a pure function. It's not. I get it. Pure has a real meaning. But pure also has, you know, like any word in any language, it has other associated meanings. And I think there's a lot of, um, this is a neckbeard and he's holier than thou. Uh, there's a fair amount of discourse out there about functional programming that's dismissive or snobby about if it's not pure, if it's not completely purely functional, it's not good, it's not useful. I mean, these are things we aspire to. That's kind of what I said about functions, like that rule about function is something we aspire to. Mm, maybe you don't hit it all the time. That doesn't mean that functional programming concepts can't improve your code. And as you pointed out, people have been using these things in Java, which is supposed, you know, a language designed for object orientation for quite a while. These are, these are useful concepts, and the goals they're trying to achieve are useful concepts, whether you're writing pure Haskell or not. I think it's good to remember, so. Uh, finally, I'd like to say thank you, and I would like to wind up with um, a picture. I hope that you learned to write your code more badass, and I hope that you learned how much that I like pie. And so I would like to close it out by showing a picture of Pam Greer eating pie and giving Julia Roberts a dirty look. Thank you so much. <laughs>